Cecilia and I met through uh, fascinating human beings, Ferris and Rosa Yakov in a group, Genius Steals, in a, in a group that was set up to kind of do this, get diverse opinions. Uh, Cecilia is an entrepreneurial ecosystem builder. I'll let her kind of explain that. She is the founder of Mass Collaboration. And, you know, she's a lover of people, words, and ideas. And I loved when she shared with me that her favorite person is Ivy Elizabeth, who's just embarking on her own adventures, having recently arrived in the world. Uh, though Bruce Springsteen, as I know from my past interactions with Cecilia, is big on her list as well. Cecilia, when you look at this idea of connections, you've created something that didn't really exist even as a profession or as a focus of what you're doing now. And can you talk about that and the purposeful and intent behind that, how it can make a difference in strengthening human connections? Well, thank you. And thanks to Tomas and Matt for setting up the things that I was going to share so well. Um, I, in the entrepreneurial ecosystem building that I do, it's really about connecting people who need resources with the people who have them, right? It's the ecosystem building is like the mycelium, that, that invisible network of um, fungi in the forest where the nutrients go from one source to another. And so that connectivity matters and whether or not you can see it. So we've brought that kind of approach and vision into what we do around communities, organizations, as well as in certain um, ecosystems like um, a sector. So thinking about 2020, that was the year that tore the world apart, right? We sheltered in place, fear and hate rocked our nation. We managed to keep it together with the help of technology and modern medicine. But even those things caused a lot of heated arguments and still do. We learned a new way of being. We were more disjointed, socially distant, working and learning remotely. And last time this year, I bet a lot of us were thinking, I remember thinking this year was gonna make up for 2020. Well, it's been kind of a mixed bag. Uh, the vaccine got approved and perhaps we would be able to re-engage with colleagues and friends and family. And, it's hard to believe that 2021 is over and it seems like such a blur, right? So some of us were fortunate, we got to travel and reconnect. But the growing trend, as you showed, is towards detachment. And sometimes that's through other people's decisions and sometimes it's through our own. So though the world has become more connected, we're growing lonelier and more isolated. As conversations, as Matt pointed out, are so polarizing and the divide and the differences get greater among us. And we seem to have forgotten all about that civil discourse, how to get along and compromise is a nasty word and it's a sign of weakness. So now that I've thoroughly depressed you, I'll <laughs> tell you a little bit more about me and why I got to do the things that I do. My family comes from Taiwan, so we're the capitalist Chinese. I was born in Japan and I grew up in New York City. So I've spent a great deal of time trying to fit in. Although I was born in Japan and my first spoken words were in that language, I wasn't considered Japanese. In fact, my first passport was issued by a country I'd never been to. We immigrated to the United States. I grew up in an Italian, Irish, and Jewish neighborhood. And obviously I don't blend. So being an immigrant felt like an outsider looking in all the time. And the first time I really felt that sense of belonging was in high school. I'm kind of smart, which was something that I was raised not to say out loud, but I don't believe that it's something that you should hide as if it's something you should be ashamed of. So I do well on tests and I went to a public magnet school in New York City. Most of the people there were geeks. We talked about things kids in the neighborhood didn't. Our classmates didn't consider each of us you know, odd because we read a lot or we wanted to have conversations about ideas and concepts. And all of us were a little bit weird right, and nerdy, and I felt this great sense of belonging, and it was really powerful, and I'm proud that I attended a school that graduated more Nobel laureates than any other learning institution, so there's that, but going back to that feeling about finding your people, it, it creates that feeling of being seen and heard. It's a universal desire. You're one of seven billion plus people in the world, Sometimes it's hard to feel special and significant in those numbers, 
but that sense of belonging keeps you feeling affirmed. Most living things have that desire to be around or at least recognized when they see another of their species. It's called flocking. So that's a survival instinct, right? You see birds flock together and herds flock together. And, and it can, in humans, it can also be an affinity seeking behavior, which also leads to bias but that's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. So the similarities can be recognized in major identity markers, such as gender, race, age, or things that you can't see. Um, so recognition like interests, like a particular sport. So I like baseball and teams. So heaven help me, I root for the Mets. And music genres, as Maury um, shared, I'm a big, huge Bruce Springsteen fan. So when you get around that community of people that geek out of the same things you do, it's exciting. So uh, you can uh, identify with a community. So growing up in New York, I'm a New Yorker. So no matter how many years I haven't lived there, I don't always cross at the intersection, right? So let me get back to the bias stuff. In the ecosystem building work that I do, cultural awareness and inclusion are a big part of that work. My work is centered around, isn't centered around like how racist are you, but more about the awareness of who we are and how we recognize and connect with people around you. And I wanna share some terminology with you. We hear a lot about DNI, diversity and inclusion, DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion, DIB, diversity, inclusion and belonging. And it seems like a whole bunch of alphabet soup sometimes. And it's a little daunting. So people have reactions to those terms and diversity fatigue is real. But I'm going to indulge you. Um, if you'll indulge me, let me share my preferred acronym. If you can remember the word abide, a-B-I-D-E. It stands for access, which is about building pathways, belonging, which is about that, that condition that we want to all be in, inclusion, which is an action verb, and diversity, which is pretty much a fact, and equity, that state of being where we can tilt the playing field so that it can be more balanced, right? It's not about sameness. And those cultural values, the ways we show up, is about our relationship with things like time and ambiguity and power dynamic. Are you more action oriented? Are you more individualistic? Those are the things where that affects the relationships that you have or you don't have because other people don't show up like you. I grew up in New York, so things happen in a New York minute. If you're living on island time and I ask you to meet me somewhere and you show up 15 minutes fashionably late, I may feel offended. But if I recognize that that's not your lived experience, then maybe there's a little bit more empathy like Tomas said. So I tend to focus on belonging. And why does that matter? Well, for a lot of companies that are struggling with the great resignation, we're growing aware that it's not about that $600 unemployment benefit right? People are leaving communities. There's more isolation all the time. And people need to own up to the fact that, you know what, our culture kind of sucks for a lot of people. So expanding that awareness helps mitigate that disconnection and exclusion, which leads to dropout. So how do we do this? I'm going to share a slide. So let's hope that that technology works. And it all starts, you can see my screen, right? That levels of, in, of mass collaboration. Okay, so let me make sure my mouse gets here. And it all starts with an invitation. People need to know that they're invited. So they need to be able to know that they can show up, right? If you wanna go wider, but not specify, then people show up in a lot of different ways. So that invitation should be bold and intentional. Get their attention and tell them specifically why they're there. If they don't know how to show up or why they're showing up, then they show up in different ways and it's not their fault. So be clear and intentional, but cast the net widely so that you get a wide range of people. In that invitation, you'll build community. When you get to know each other better, you build the trust that Matt was talking about. 
And without it, conversations and interactions remain very transactional. There is very little investment towards the future. And if that is, then it'll be finite. Everything moves at the speed of trust. Then, let's see, then you get better communication and visibility. So then we're actually talking to each other and engaging, right? I wanna make a note of saying something though about dissent. Dissent is something that we try to hush up because we think that if you're allowed and argue that you don't care about the community, you're just being a pain. But you know, usually people who dissent care really about that community. If they didn't care, they'd go away. So sometimes you think that the problem is gone because the people are gone. The problem's probably still there, but unfortunately, nobody's communicating that with you, okay? So now we've got communication, and then with the communication, so we know each other better, then we get coordination and alignment. It's kind of like traffic laws. You don't have to follow the traffic laws, but if you don't, there's a larger chance of collision. So we traffic, we follow those traffic laws, so we coordinate. Think about if I wanted to get from point A to point B, for me, it would be easier if I went faster and in a straight line. Why do we go slower, follow the signs? Don't go speeding down the one-way street on the wrong way. Well, usually it goes back to the fact that you're part of a community. You care about that community. So for the betterment of all of us, you're going to follow those community guidelines that you all put together. That's how you get to that collaboration. And when we were thinking about this, we thought about this Maslow's hierarchy of need, right? If you can actualize and self-actualize, then you actually grow. But also thinking about the way Maslow is thought about, you don't actually build to this pinnacle you actually grow to something greater than yourself. So we flip the triangle upside down and remember that this is gonna take time. So that's basically it. If you don't remember anything else that I've said, then I'm gonna invite you to think about a couple of different words. Um, number one, if you think about people, this is the magic equation that I learned when I was consulting at the Kauffman Foundation. People plus culture equals everything, right? So if you can remember that, then you're at least going on the right direction. And one of my favorite quotes from somebody I greatly admire is Margaret Wheatley. And she said, no matter the problem, community is the solution, so. Thank you so much. And Cecilia, I'd, I'd ask Cecilia to take a little bit of time to share that framework because I think there's some real things that we can apply in our lives. And, and, and go across in terms of the organization that we work with, but in our own lives and the people that we have and the purposeful intent that Tomas, you talked about your idea of what you wanna do, very strong there. 